nozzle went from the floor to the ceiling and covered the entire area. It wasn't a matter of just putting two or three paintings on each of the walls. It's a much larger work than I've ever done before, probably ever do again. sight seeing this the space for the first time. I mean there were two 80 foot walls meeting at a right angle, um, making 160 feet overall and basically 20 feet of height, which is an incredible space. On seeing it for the first time I just felt that you know it was an amazing challenge to do a painting that had fit into that space and not just to be a painting that sort of is on the wall that um, you just view only as a painting, but something to actually, that would actually, um, you know, enhance the whole area and the whole environment and actu actually work in with the whole uh, architectural space there. It's a mammoth exercise. Um, it's an exciting thing to do because uh, of the scale and the immensity of it. One of the first problems was, of course, in covering that entire area, 160 feet by 20 feet of the wall area. Uh, artist materials like canvas and so on were absolutely out. I mean, there's no way I could use canvas. Um, and it was decided on to, to use plywood. It's waterproof ply basically form ply. They're suitable because they're very uh, rugged and uh, unlikely to warp and twist and buckle and so on. What I want the paint to do is to express itself and have its own, express something of its own. I mean, I could have just painted that brown, like painting a wall or something. And through the process of applying the paint, um, you actually see things as you're applying. I mean, the paint's making the marks. You're allowing the paint, or giving the paint the freedom to express itself. It's great that dark, that grey coming through. It's a bit different to what I <laughs> thought it would be, but you know, I'm quite happy with that grey coming through that bronzy green colour. There's no such thing for me as underpainting or undercoats or preparation or sketching in first and filling in or anything like that. Every mark from the raw white canvas is there as if it's going to stay there forever. One of the characteristics of this paint is that you have to use it very thin and it's a build-up of sort of thin washes of colour. It's not like oil paint where you can get very thick build-ups very quickly. Painting is like, it has to be almost a bit like um, very positive statements. All the paintings I do, it's about making positive marks with paint, very positive marks, and if you always keep making positive marks, like putting down positive marks or statements with paint, with a brush or whatever it is, what you end up with is a, almost a woven work which made, is made up entirely of positive marks and positive thinking. this whole area here will probably be covered again, I don't know, but it's a matter of climbing up on a ladder and looking down and seeing if it's any good, because you're so close to it you can't really see. No, it's... Um, but you know, it's, it's a start.
Well, I just started off as a kid, I suppose, painting things quite realistically, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but then, of course, the whole thing evolves and develops, and uh, you get ideas from all over the place. And, uh, you know, they, it all just grows and gets bigger and bigger. Usually I just work on linen canvas, which comes all the way from Belgium, especially woven for artists, and it's primed with white special primers and rabbit skin and glue and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, there's the same caring for the ground that you work on. sailing or going out on the boat is that you know the boat itself is almost a vehicle it's a vehicle I, I use the boat almost like a vehicle to give me access to the ideas and the inspiration there are all sorts of ab abstract ideas about sailing that um, you know get through to me and it's almost trying to apply some of those ideas to to painting, but not trying to render it by having a big boat in the painting with sort of a wave and so on. But you're on this sort of you're in this sort of ominous thing that actually has, has got a hell of a lot going for it, which inspires me for a start. I mean, the fact that there's tension in the rigging, there's the looseness, the softness of the sail, which can, when there's a breeze blowing like the other day, um, almost make the sail like a brick wall. It's so hard with the pressure of the wind. So there's all sorts of pressures and tensions, soft things, hard things, and in the applying of paint, it's about how one area of paint might meet another area of paint, how one loose bit of paint might splash over with sort of dribbles and drips and things over a harder sort of area of paint, which is just like a wave crashing against the seawall or something. It's the looseness of one area hitting the hardness of another area. It's a pretty neurotic sort of activity. I mean, it's a strange activity. I mean, you're basically totally on your own. It's not like any other sort of activity where people generally, and perhaps writers and so on, but generally people are working with other people. Painters tend to be sort of stuck away in a room on their own somewhere, or a studio or a workshop. So you're totally on your own with artistic decision. Uh, and of course, trying to make the right ones, or, or hoping you've made the right ones, or allowing, or, or just making the right ones, is is often uh, a traumatic experience. I mean, you get committed to an idea, you get committed to a concept. Um, there's no reason in the world why you can't change your mind, and you often do. And of course, to people that don't usually work like that, they think it's indecision or lack of knowing what you're doing, but really you're discovering as you're going. You're discovering as, you, as you're making. The whole process of making the work is one of discovery and uh, you know often in making the discovery you change your mind it's a bit like being a gold prospector or something and uh, you decide to go around the bend of the river instead of staying where you are
One of the reasons I might have got the job is that, uh, well, I don't know whether the other people steer clear of the corner, because, I mean, I found that an amazing challenge actually dealing with this corner. On the other side, opposite the corner, there's a grey granite wall, which is beyond about five, or I think five, seven stainless steel columns that are immense, highly polished and highly reflective. The idea was to continue this greyness around into the mural so that you'd get one colour, say, for instance, in the mural that had ricochet and bounce through all the columns and repeat and repeat and reflect and reflect backwards and forwards and so on from wherever you were standing, which is an incredible thing to have working for you. One of the things I felt when I was, when I submitted the idea was that in, with the work going from the floor to the ceiling, I mean, obviously there'd be a lot of public traffic and so on, people touching it, a very tactile thing. I wanted people to touch it, I wanted people to be able to feel it and so on. Um, and so it's one of those things that people will be able to go up and touch and look at and so on without damaging it at all. You know, it's made especially for this job, this paint. It's not just off the shelf. Most artists' materials are pretty fragile. I mean, oil paint takes a long time to dry. Um, and it's not a very durable surface. I mean, you can't wash it, you can't clean it. When this thing is actually up there, it will almost be able to be cleaned by somebody that cleans windows in office buildings with squeegees and things. It's that sort of durable finish. It's a very tough paint film. And they use it for painting boats and aeroplanes and spaceships and so on. But it was just really a matter of going to the most, to the most durable material. It's almost like a watercolour technique. I mean, it's, the paint has to be used very thinly. Um, you can't actually have too much thickness or build-up because what happens is it cures on the surface and traps uncured material below it, which never cures. It's like putting a lid on jars. So basically, it's a matter of building up the paint relatively thinly and um, allowing, allowing the work basically to be about a whole lot of thinner washes of colour more than... Uh, thick globules. Where there are thick areas of paint in the, in the work, they're done with another material altogether, which is polyester paint. that appear in most of the things that I do and I've carried on into this which is one uh, paint representing nature in an abstract sort of way the looseness of the paint um, the freedom of applying the paint um, against a more considered sort of controlled decision-making type of application of paint and it can be a toothbrush or a house painter's brush. Painters don't have to use um, artist painters, that is, or any other painter, have to use these sort of brushes that the art supply shop supply. I mean, a broom is a brush. important things to please yourself and I mean really move yourself when you do a painting you've got to really sort of put a lot into it and then there's a possibility that you might get something out of it I mean speaking for myself I mean I tend to be one of those people that enjoy or not enjoy but I go through this process of making things being obsessed with making things I tend to work quite obsessively when I work uh, very relatively quickly uh, the thing works and then it's finished uh, and it 
that at the point when it's finished, it's when it's actually saying something to me. I don't know how the Chinese or the Orientals would read this, but uh, Western man reads things from left to right, and of course this is the far extremity of the, of the page, and you need something to bring your eye around again, so you go back along the top of the picture. It's got this far and, you know, when it is on the wall in Melbourne, I mean, that's when it's decided if it's finished because you just don't know what the thing's going to look like. When things are taken out of their environment and put into another environment, uh, especially one like the bank, where it's a clean, sort of pristine, immaculate modern building, it's nothing to do with this sort of factory environment. In fact, the work seems to relate more to these arcs and beams and bits of plastic and the grey light coming through the plastic than it will possibly to the bank. And so, you know, it sort of seems to work quite well in this environment, so it's hard to say what it'll be like in another environment. The thing is that it has been hard to sort of see it as one large work, working on it on the floor and working on it in sections and so on. I mean, like everyone else, I'm going to get a surprise when I see it on the wall. So it's, it's a bit early to actually sort of anticipate that. I mean, it's like sort of building an aeroplane and hoping it'll fire. It hasn't sort of got off the ground yet. It's not on the wall. So once it sort of gets on the wall, we can all stand back and make a few comments. period that I've been involved with this, which is basically three years, um, I've actually thought about it a lot. I've uh, woken up in the middle of the night, sort of wandered around, thought about it. Other work that I've done, exhibitions I've done, other paintings I've done, all the ideas I've learnt in those pictures have also now been able to come out in this picture. pleased with it, I'm happy with it. Some things uh, that I hadn't considered are working better than I ever anticipated. Other things, uh, of course, aren't doing what I thought they might. You've got to remember that this is the first time I've seen the work in its entirety um, vertically like this, you know, so I can actually wander around and look at it in its entirety.
I've got no way of knowing how the art world or the art people or the public are going to react. And, uh, you know, um, I'm totally responsible for what's here. As I said to someone earlier, I'm not an expert. I would just consider this painting to be an outstanding example of contemporary Australian art. And I congratulate you, John, for the concept and the execution of it. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to declare the painting officially completed. Thank you. Uh, you know, whatever people can see in anything, that's, that's, uh, that's part of the work. I mean, it's not meant to portray any one view or angle or idea. It's, it's just meant to be a sort of a, an accumulation of paint that can conjure up all sorts of things for all sorts of people when they actually stand in front of it and confronted with it. You know, do people understand very much anyway? I mean, do they understand how to get to the moon? Do they understand how their TV works? Do they understand how radio works? I don't made a few attempts to find it out. But you don't, nobody really understands very much at all. But that doesn't mean that things shouldn't be made.